From the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. Welcome back to Demystifying NMO. I'm Chelsea Judge, and today's episode is just in time for Thanksgiving with a special focus on gratitude through NMO. We'll talk about some of the difficult feelings and specific psychosocial issues that can occur with NMO, multiple sclerosis, and other chronic illnesses in general. These can include anxiety, mood disorder, depression, and isolation. These mental and emotional issues can potentially be primary or meaning directly related to the pathology of the disease, in this case NMO, and this has been shown to be occurring in MS, but also secondary, meaning just having a disease like NMO and MS can frankly suck. And having a severe illness like NMO can make you feel anxious about your disease prognosis, where it may go, and make you feel very heavy and isolated and maybe even depressed. And the disease and associated feelings can be very tricky and difficult to face. Although my husband doesn't have NMO, my husband Austin, he does have MS and he deals with a lot of these tough feelings as well. And as his wife, I can be honest and say that it has been sometimes really difficult dealing with MS. The never knowing where the disease is going to take you or what it's going to take from you. But that being said, my husband is one of the best people I know and actually he credits in large part MS for making him the really great, awesome person that I know he is today. So Austin is legally blind from his MS due to optic neuritis and he said that although it's taken away his ability to see, it's given him vision in life. Something that he said that I think is pretty powerful and inspiring, at least to me, um, and it stuck with me and I think highlights the great person that he is, is that with his uh, MS-inspired vision, he said that MS has been a real struggle, but it's that struggle that's made me a stronger person, and for that, I am grateful. So I can see how this is really counterintuitive, probably for a lot of people to think of how something so difficult and pretty awful like MS and NMO and other severe chronic illnesses, the idea that it can actually potentially help make you a stronger person. But that's what my husband does feel like, that MS has strengthened him and made him more resilient and appreciative of what he does have. So many NMO patients are some of the brightest, most positive people, despite the many struggles that they face. And that's what we want to highlight here. This is timely for the holiday and Thanksgiving season when you want to find the silver lining in the situation and be grateful for what you do have. The holiday season can also be extra difficult for a lot of people because it can heighten the social isolation, anxiety, and depression. And so today we're going to walk through some mini interviews with people who live with NMO, discuss how they might cope with some of these difficult feelings that NMO has brought into their life, but also what maybe what's the silver lining of NMO? Please join me in our first discussion with Chelsea Tucker, a mother of five beautiful children, a champion of positivity, Sumaira Foundation ambassador, and also a very talented artist. Very excited to share this with you. Chelsea Tucker, thank you for being with me, the other Chelsea. <laughs> thank you for having me. I am passionate about living, living my life, and uh, no matter what that means, and no matter what it means living with. So thank you so much. Chelsea, you had a exceptional, I think, unique journey. You were you were misdiagnosed with MS for like what, eleven years? Yeah, for eleven years. I was I diagnosed when I was twenty one after I lost my eyesight in my left eye uh, due to optic neuritis. It was kind of a roller coaster for the entirety of those eleven years. Up until February of this year, two thousand nineteen, I received a neuromyelitis optica diagnosis after experiencing my second round of bilateral optic neuritis. I'm guessing like that made you feel a lot of different ways. It really did. You know what's fascinating is that I will never forget this story. We, I had been in the hospital for nearly a week and my husband was with me and we were sitting in the hospital room waiting on my neurologist. I was not anticipating this diagnosis and it's really, it's remarkable to me because my husband and I talk about this still how we had two completely different reactions to this new diagnosis. In the beginning, I felt relieved. And here's why. I spent 11 years being treated with um, disease-modifying drugs that were not working for Mm -hmm. me. And so I thought if I had MS, it was this unicorn of MS that was 
not responding to anything. So when I was told that it actually wasn't MS and the treatment's going to be different, I thought, well, awesome. Like, now we know what we're doing. Now we know the game plan. My husband, on the other hand, though, was angry. Angry at life. Angry that, because I had seen, you know, many, many different neurologists, up to 15, I think, at that point, who couldn't give me any real answers. And so he was angry just at the circumstances that I had to go through so much, that we had to go through so much. You know, it's not just the patient that walks this journey. It's everyone who is directly involved with the patient. And so he has been on this journey since we've, you know, been together. And he was angry that we had to go through so much, that my body had been put through so much, and that things may have been different, you know, had I received the correct diagnosis. But for me, I felt relief. Hmm. And how did you guys handle your very like opposing feelings well we had a lot of conversations about it and we still do so uh, I think when you receive a diagnosis I honestly feel like there is a grief process that goes along with Mm -hmm. it oh I completely agree yeah so it's grief so I maybe have start I maybe started with the acceptance phase first but I think it's also important to note that the grief cycle does not have a starting and ending point you can repeat and I think you do repeat the cycles of grief, depending on where you are and, and your disease stage and kind of what you're going through. And I think everyone around you kind of goes through the same thing. I know for me, I experienced relief. And then I did experience some anger and a little bit of denial and then a lot of anxiety that, that went along with, now that I know what this is, now I, I know what could potentially happen, now I know what is happening. There was a lot of anxiety that went along with that. Yeah, I can't even imagine. And it sounds like, you know, you have a really good partner who is able to share that journey with you a bit. And honestly, it sounds like you kind of like you together felt the range of emotions that anybody would have with it. And that Absolutely. like, like being able to communicate your feelings. Absolutely. And I think he is he's, he's fantastic. I mean, he is my best friend and we talk a lot. And I think for those um, patients who have a rare disease or any neurological condition or any chronic illness, mm-hmm. quite frankly, having someone you can talk to is paramount. And and honestly, if it's not someone that you can directly communicate with, I know social media has an amazing platform that, and I encourage everyone to reach out to media, find someone you can talk to because even though you may feel alone, you're never truly alone in this. There's always someone who's willing to kind of walk, walk, step with you and and get you I, I think that this has been really wonderful. You've talked a lot about on getting kind of thrown through the healthcare system, the roller coaster, and feeling a lot of different things, coping with your husband's reactions, talking through it, communicating, finding connections online. If you could give yourself, Chelsea, 11 years ago, any advice for what you know now? What would you tell yourself then? Like any pieces of advice for handling the feelings that are to come? That's a great question. I think that it is paramount that you acknowledge how you feel in the moment and and keep that as very, very valid. And understand that it's okay to feel the way that you feel and that you should feel your feelings. (laughs) That's exactly what you should do. You shouldn't push them down. You shouldn't try to hide them them and you need to feel them. I think that the other side of gratitude is really truly acknowledging what you feel and without judgment, without judging yourself for feeling that way and just experiencing that. Oh, you are really good. You should have your own Oprah show. I really, really appreciate you for highlighting that. For people who are experiencing a hard time right now, I've always told myself this. You could be experiencing hard times, but there's always something to be thankful for. But there's an art to practicing gratitude. It's not just something that we can't just jump to the rainbow thought. Mm -hmm. Um, There's what I'm thankful for. We really have to practice. And so for me and, and my journey, I've been very, very intentional about finding the little things to be grateful for particularly on the good days, because practicing that on the very good days comes in very handy when things are not so good, 
and you don't have to look so hard if you've been looking all along. For me, practicing gratitude does not mean that I need to abandon the hard feelings that I have, but it definitely gives me a momentary shift of my attention to what's going right. I know for me, I do a lot of journaling. I know journaling is not everybody's jam, but practicing gratitude doesn't mean you have to write it all down. You can just think. You can just acknowledge the things that are going right. But on the really rough days, I look back at the journal prompts that I've written about and just say, like, this is really going right. And, you know, look at things that are going really, really well because I've never had a day in which I've not been able to find something that's gone right. What is it? Do you think there's anything specific through your, I don't even know how to say it, your official MS NMO journey um, that has given you extra gratitude or a different look on life? There's a few things that have made me see life differently. Losing my eyesight. I know that that sounds bizarre in a way that I'm thankful for losing my eyesight, but what it has done for me in my life is given me a different perspective on the way that I see life Mm -hmm. and to appreciate all the things that I can see. Um, I remember when I had bilateral osteoporosis and I was devastated that I hadn't taken the time to see my kids' eyes mm. and to study the color of their eyes. And I promised myself that if I retained enough of my vision, I was going to look at everything. And I was going to study the things that were important because if, if I ever lost my vision again, I really wanted to remember. So I was very, very intentional when I got my eyesight back eight months later to really kind of study everything. And when I lost my eyesight again this year, and it hasn't yet returned, I, in some ways, though I was devastated, I was very, very thankful that I could recall and remember the things that were most important to me because I'd taken the time to look and be very, very intentional about what I was paying attention to. Overall, I think that having a chronic illness like NMO and even living with an MS diagnosis for 11 years, it taught me how to live fully alive and that the that I have today, the the faculties that I have today, I may not have tomorrow and really, truly appreciate the things that I can do today. Chelsea Tucker, killing me again. You are an inspiration. (laughs) You're so kind. Thank you. It was a true pleasure to chat with Chelsea about her experiences. Chelsea highlighted a number of really difficult feelings that people with NMO may experience. And because my background is science, I'm just going to back up the conversation that we had um, with some data. I just recently read one small study by Maury Mealy and Dr. Levy, which found that about 70% of NMOSD patients involved in that study experienced some level of anxiety or depression. And it seems overall like those patients with NMOSD and MS are much more likely to experience these kinds of issues than the general population. Other studies suggest that these symptoms like anxiety and depression have negative effects on quality of life. In one study recently published in Multiple Sclerosis and Related Disorders, evaluated relationships between resilience, so your ability to get through and stay strong, as well as psychiatric symptoms, and quality of life in patients with MS and NMOSD. They concluded that resilience may serve to prevent or reduce those feelings of depression and anxiety and can help maintain quality of life regardless of what the physical disability looked like. So perhaps gaining resilience serves as this protective role for your overall well-being that can help thwart against those darker feelings. And I really think that that is what Chelsea was demonstrating with her experience, that you don't ignore those difficult feelings. You actually process them and work through. And when you get to the other side, you're a stronger uh, person and you gain that resilience that can help protect you when those dark feelings come again. I next had the pleasure of speaking with Ron Crow. Ron is the rare of the rare. He is a male living with NMOSD. He was recently diagnosed with NMO just this year, in fact. Ron is another inspiring figure in the NMO community and a very devoted husband. So I'm really excited to share our conversation. Hi, Ron. Thank you again for talking with me today. I didn't know if there was any, like when you were first diagnosed versus now, if you know, you learn to cope with some of the, the aspects of the disease? 
Yeah, so, I, I, you know, I had a, had a chance to kind of think about that question. And, and, you know, I've always been the kind of person that really tried to do a self-check. And, and what I really mean by that is I do a lot of kind of the introspective assessment. You know, am I alone in this? My answer is typically a resounding no. Mm -hmm. you know, early on in my diagnosis, which was in March of this year, you know, I thought about kind of two words, really. You know, once I was diagnosed, it was really, well, now what? And what with, you know, my life, what, what will my life look like from now on? I, I was, uh, you know, uh, uh, hopeful at first that once I had the diagnosis and then it kind of went back to, well, okay, great. So we've got the diagnosis. Now what? Oh, there's a treatment. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, oh, now what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Much of that now, what thinking really has to do with, uh, again, you know, I'll put air quotes around it and say, you know, what will my life look like from now on? And really, my main coping mechanism with, with the, my challenges with the, the NMO is n knowing that I have the greater kind of NMO community, knowing that I'm not alone. Uh, I've, I, I have many sadly sisters and brothers who, who share the same joys and concerns that i do and i share with them so how do i cope it's kind of just that it's being kind of an active participant in the community with a greater kind of purpose in life now that that i've bump, become part of the nmo community it's really i've been i've, I've made it a point to really embrace it and I, i'm i'm thankful that that's become part of my life and you know kind of, kind of seems counterintuitive but for me uh, and you know even in the darkest days um it it it, it kind of gave me uh, more purpose so that's really the the the, the thoughts the difficult feelings and mm -hmm. the challenges that i've had it's it's been been helpful to kind of work through it that way I think that's some like a common or not common. It's been an overlapping theme I've heard yeah. is that, you know, you're not in this alone, whether it's, you know, your family, your partner, the greater NMO community, that it is a very vibrant and strong community it to is, be a part of. Yeah. Because you are the rare of the rare being a male with NMO. Do you find yeah. that that has any unique perspective? Yeah, you know, it, 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 it's interesting to kind of look at that. And, and you know, I really, it, 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 in my life um, outside of NMO before I became uh, part of the community, there, there were always kind of leading figures in my life that were, were women. You know, it, it, it just seems logical for me as, as a man who, who's always had an opportunity to interact well with women to now be a part of this thing that, that affects mainly, you know, females in, in this, uh, this space. So it's, uh, you know, it's been, been interesting. Uh, I think we're all kind of rare in this thing because it's, you know, it's, it, it's a pretty rare um, phenomenon and disease and, you know, the, the, the way it's dealt with. But I, I, I consider myself to be lucky to be a no, I, I, I completely understand what you're saying. That like that is a vibrant community, and you're in solidarity with them. Yeah, I mean, it. it some some you know guys might have a problem with it. Ah, you know, I the, the the women who've been in my life have been a motivating factor in my life, and being a part of the community and it being predominantly women. You know, uh, I know I, I talked to Connor and Connor says, great to see another guy in the room. You know? <laughs> and that that kind of, you know, it, it, it's interesting, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in, kind of indifferent to it. OK, yeah. And I, probably because what you're saying is that you feel like you share so uh, many similarities or like common struggles as the rest of the people with NMO, even if they are yeah. predominantly women. Yeah. I mean, everybody's condition is a bit different right so i mean i, I had my attack in february I, I got my diagnosis in march i was bedridden for a good 90 days wow, and then yeah. it kind of got to where i worked into a wheelchair into a walker and a cane and then finally now i'm kind of getting my wobble on and you know and, and i'm encouraging you know all of my sisters and brothers out there to you know it, 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 for me, one of, one of the neurologists said to me, uh, Will Matter said, 
you know, it's going to be months, it's going to be years before you, know, you you get to a point to where you've gained what you're going to gain. And so, I, you know, I haven't been too hard on myself, but it was an adjustment. I mean, mm-hmm. mentally, physically, an adjustment. Um, coming to grips with, um, you know, what this really means for the rest of my life. And uh, again, I kind of go back to the word purpose. It's it's added more to me. I, I'm 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 really excited about being a participant actively uh, in in what goes on uh, with uh, my family uh, in the NMO community. You have such a great attitude and, and perspective, and although not an NMO patient, but as an advocate, thank you for your passion and willingness to participate and step up and be your own advocate and speak up for um, others in the community. Sure. Thank you. After my chat with Ron, I really noticed a couple of overlaps from my conversation with Chelsea, and that is this kind of counterintuitive thing that I've also noted in my own family, is that you do gain resilience and this newfound sense of purpose that pushes you forward to thrive with these chronic illnesses. And Ron touched on another really, I think, key important point, sense of community and how powerful that can be. In blue zones where they have really long lifespans, great longevity. One of the big components of these extended lifespans is social support, is having a strong sense of community, people who rally behind you and get you through life so that you can thrive and feel connected. And that that inherently gives you another important component, purpose. And so while, again, this can seem counterintuitive, that something is difficult and sometimes tragic as NMO actually can give you a really vibrant, strong, powerful community that provides you with this new sense of purpose that I thought was just a really beautiful perspective that Ron had. Next, I'm going to be sharing the conversation that I had with Marie Nubro, who is a really strong woman, mother, freelance graphic designer, who's battled NMO optic neuritis has lost her vision in her left eye, but again, has found a new sense of purpose. And I'm extremely grateful that she opened up and was able to share her experiences and strong view that she's gained through NMO. Really powerful patient advocate story. Hi, Kelsey. I'm really excited. And I've only been diagnosed for a little over three years. I've read worse stories. You know, I didn't get a diagnosis for 20 years or 15 years. And I think, oh, my gosh, well, you know, maybe my year was not, you know, it could have been a lot longer. So I'm very grateful for finding the doctor and team that I have now. I think that's a great perspective, and I hope that the stories for NMO don't be like, oh, I'm just grateful that I wasn't misdiagnosed for 10 or more years. So you're a stay-at-home mom. You were diagnosed with MS after going blind in one eye. Like, God, that's terrifying. Like, how did that feel? Well, I got diagnosed with um, viral meningitis. That was my very first official diagnosis. It just didn't make any sense. I mean, I was... I had done IV steroids and um, for five days, and it was just getting worse and more sick. When I was doing the research online for viral meningitis, it said, you know, the virus just runs its course, and it's awful, but you'll get over it, and you'll recover. And I just didn't feel like that last puzzle piece was there for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it doesn't explain the vision loss. Right. In a questioning experience. But we finally said, she said, you know, I do know of this doctor who specializes in eye disorders, why don't I recommend, you, or I'll recommend that you, you go see him. And my husband and I just kind of felt like, why wasn't this mentioned a long time ago? Yeah. I find so much, like, commonality through a lot of NMO stories is, like, finally being uh, connected with somebody who is an expert in, like, either ophthalmology or neurology to, to really be able to figure it out and get a handle on things. So we just kept pushing. So that's what I encourage, like, when I'm on these online forums and in these Facebook groups and stuff and people are just, you know, they're just going through the diagnosis process. Encourage them to like just keep pushing, just find that neurologist that knows what they're talking Mm -hmm. about. 
because of the, so many different reasons, whether it's NMO, MS, or other severe chronic illnesses, there's so many, what I sum up as difficult feelings, which is frustration, anger, anxiety, maybe like isolation, depression sometimes, whether it's directly from NMO or just because the nature of dealing with a, something like this is just inherently difficult, right? Very difficult. Yeah, there's a lot of all those things that you mentioned, for sure. Family, I mean, goes through that, too. The silver lining is definitely perspective and strength. Um, you, do have, you have no choice but to go through this. So there's a lot of different ways that you can handle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for better or worse. And, and, and the cards that you've been dealt. But not much rocks my... How do I say this? Not much affects me... Like the, sm- the little things, the small things, um, it takes a lot to get me upset be- just because you have that perspective. Mm-hmm. Like, it's hard, all the things that you do go through. Yeah, I-, I think that you almost lose sight of, oh, yeah, I did deal with all that. Oh, yeah, I have got through all that. Because like, like you said, you kind of probably go into like autopilot or something to just get through it. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. You know, I think a lot of us are raised too to just, you know, you push through, you mm-hmm. do the best that you can, and then at some point it will hit you that e- either feelings you haven't dealt with or processed or it'll come out in other ways. I completely it's agree. It's important to kind of work through it. And, and that can be so difficult too, just like you're saying, because, because you have to be a good mom. Like you have, you have to be there for your kids or you have to fight your insurance company or uh, go to meetings, et cetera. And mm-hmm. sometimes like we almost like bury those feelings, but it, I, I think you said it really perfectly. But if you don't deal with them, they come out. They do. And they come out in different ways, depression, anger, um, irritability. There's all kinds of things that will surface over time, for sure. How have you found, if you don't mind sharing, like, in handling them or coping with them? So, I was realizing that I was having a a ton of symptoms of irritability and anger and frustration over little things. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my gosh, well, maybe I need to see my therapist. I'm very candid and open about that. I am very pro-therapy. I think she's helped me work through the grief Mm -hmm. that I didn't realize. um, I didn't label it as grief, but it really is. I mean, you are going through a grieving process of so many things. Your previous self, your relationship with your husband before diagnosis, your things will never be the same, and you have to deal with that. So she's helped me cope with a lot of um, things and given me different tools. Mm -hmm. Like, for example just different ways to work through my day and conserve energy. If I've got an event to go to or, you know, maybe a kid's concert or something that evening, I have to pace myself during the day. I can't stand a lot anymore. Right. I get physically and emotionally very fatigued very quickly. So just paying attention to that stuff and pacing myself. Well, that's been my, my main tool. I think there is a ton of fear that all of us, patients and caregivers and people around us that deal with fear, Mm-hmm. And so I've tried to deal with that in my own way of just, okay, what can I do to feel more secure about this? I have my doctor and my team in place now. I We have talked through a plan. If I have another attack, what happens? I think another tool that has helped me deal with the feelings of fear is just learning as much as I can, mm-hmm. which is pretty difficult in the beginning because everything that you find online can it's be terrifying. Terrifying. But uh, facing that and realizing, okay, I'm this is where I fit into that spectrum, and I'm taking care of myself and making smart choices and surrounding myself with people that are supportive, I feel like that's helped with the fear a little bit. I'm very similar, and not even just because of my like research background, just always, I think. You know, I've tried to, I believe in knowledge is power, and it makes me feel like even though you don't have all this control, you're taking as much control as you can. Yeah. It sounds like you have developed a lot of good tools to handling this, like being educated, being aware of your boundaries sort of thing, like with fatigue, um, how you cope with that, being honest about them. Yeah. You kind of highlighted before, I thought really nicely, like what you found the silver lining to be, which is like gaining strength. Cause you, as you said, you didn't really, you don't really have a choice. Is there anything else you would add to that? You don't live your life 
worrying about how, like, when the end is coming. At least I didn't before this. But then the, that perspective really shifted, like, okay, I've got this. My time may be limited. I don't know if I'm going to live to 95. I don't know if I'm going to live, you know, how long that's, how that is going to pan out. And so you just really focus on, okay, what do I want? What are my goals? What do I want to accomplish? What do I want to be left to my daughters? All kinds of thoughts go through your mind, but you definitely gain a ton of perspective. Thank you so much for sharing that. When it all happened with my brother, it obviously, you know, rocked my family's world. And that is exactly how I feel just being secondary to it. It's changed my perspective on life in that same way. I never thought about how your life can change as you know it in a minute. And and it's made me way more appreciative of what you have and, and making the most and helping in any way that you can. And Ah, hearing you say that after personally living through it is really powerful. Oh, thanks. I think a lot of us do so much to, there's so much effort put into looking normal and acting normal Mm -hmm. so we can interact with the world like we did before. Yep. And that is draining. I think it's great to put, you know, tell these stories because they can apply beyond NMO for people dealing with chronic illness. 100%. Thank you so much, Marie, again, for chatting with me today. It was an honor. Marie highlighted a number of really difficult feelings that NMO uh, going through a really convoluted diagnosis process brought into her life, but she also talked about tools or ways that she found to help cope with those feelings. Some of those ways were things that also Ron and Chelsea highlighted, being connection, finding community. So connecting with someone you love, you know, pick up the phone, make a coffee date, watch Netflix with a friend, find somebody or find a group on social media, anything. Also, like Marie highlighted, find a therapist if you think that might work for you. I'm also a big advocate for them as well and being able to cope with these challenging feelings. Movement, also being physically active, exercising has been shown to help with mood and can also help you get to sleep each night, which we also know can help with your mood. This doesn't have to be anything crazy. Just go for a walk with a friend, again, emphasizing connection. Pace around your living room, ride a bike, just get moving. And please know that you are not alone. As nearly everyone has emphasized, NMO um, can be very difficult, but there's a strong, vibrant community. NMO has changed my family's life in so many ways, and many of them have been tough. But the silver lining to me is this strong, vibrant NMO community that's full of warm and gracious people. Thanks again to all of our amazing patient advocates, Chelsea, Marie, and Ron, for sharing their perspectives, what they're grateful for after enduring such difficult experiences. And thank you again, listeners, for joining through us and being again a part of this strong community. Please give us your feedback. Check us out at the SumiraFoundation.org and ConnorBJudgeFoundation.org. Please look forward to our next podcast, which will be on uh, certain hot topics of sex and NMO, followed by pregnancy and NMO. Good stuff ahead. Stay tuned.